So um, as Gary already mentioned, um, following Alan is, is certainly a challenging task. So you can imagine my tasks is made even harder since I'm following both Alan and Gary. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, honor of uh, Alan receiving the uh, Pittsburgh Analytical Chemistry Award. And really, most of the techniques, in fact, everything I'm going to talk about today um, has been made possible by developments from Allen's group, um, namely the invention of uh, Fourier transform, ion cyclotron resonance, uh, mass spectrometry. And so I will have um, some of the FTICR material in here. But in trying to prepare this talk and think about what I should be uh, um, presenting, I thought I'd also include um, Alan's other passion, which is electrochemistry, which many of you probably are unaware of. Um, but uh, as evidence, this is a uh, picture of Alan in a Tesla dealership. And uh, whether it's mass spectrometry or electrochemistry, Alan really pursues uh, the absolute state-of-the-art high-performance uh, uh, apparatus. <coughs> All right, so when you think about electrochemistry and photochemistry in the gas phase, this is uh, what uh, might immediately come to mind. This is a uh, picture taken from the Z pinch machine at uh, Sandia. And this is an electrical discharge, which is a result of trying to generate very high magnetic fields. Um, this also happens in tokamaks when things go horribly wrong. And of course, these absolutely wonderful pictures is a result of both electrochemistry and photochemistry in the gas phase. All right, in contrast, we're going to be talking about somewhat more controlled experiments on both the electrochemistry and photochemistry. And specifically, what we're going to be doing is trying to use um, both electrochemistry and photochemistry to determine something about a solution phase property of the ion that you really can't get from conventional experiments. And really, all the experiments I'm going to tell you about, um, we're going to be having an ion which is contained in an aqueous nanodrop, which is trapped and stored in an ICR mass spectrometer. And of course, these experiments are made possible um, through electrospray ionization. Okay? And so just to give you a sense of the experiment, this is a uh, nice picture, um, which is a result of Tom Leisner and Bernd Huber, where they've trapped a highly charged droplet and this droplet is charged very close to the Rayleigh limit. And what you can see is when it exceeds the Rayleigh limit, um, you can see ions or droplets being ejected on either side. And the key thing to note is when this discharge event happens, basically uh, you generate somewhere on the order of about 100 tiny droplets, which carry away less than 1% of the overall mass of the original droplet but they themselves are very highly charged. And so they carry away about a third of the original charge on the droplet. Okay? And so in all the experiments I'm going to show you, basically what we're going to do is take this first generation of droplets, transfer them intact through a mass spectrometer, and store them in ultra-high vacuum. Okay? And these are going to be temperature-controlled experiments and mass-selected. OK, so now in trying to think about why you want to do electrochemistry in the gas phase, um, a couple of potential advantages is that we're only going to use a single electrode. It's not going to be made of any uh, precious metals, neither gold nor platinum. So in principle, this is a very inexpensive experiment. Um, in practice, the rest of the apparatus costs considerably more than a potentiostat, so that's um, kind of a wash. Um, we never can foul electrodes um, unless you happen to lose vacuum. Um, this is actually a, a very nice advantage, which is we don't have to worry about junction potentials. Okay? And the reason for that is our electrodes are not in contact with the actual sample. Okay? And one of the key advantages is that we can control the uh, contents of the nanodrop. And this is done through simple mass selection. And so what this means is if we have a single ion in the nanodrop, this is the equivalent of running an experiment at infinite dilution. Okay? Um, we can also add a specific number of counter ions, and I'll show you um, examples of that towards the end. Here's another key difference between solution and gas phase electrochemistry. Um, in solution, um, you have plenty of electrons, and you're controlling the experiment with a potential. Whereas in the gas phase, we're actually controlling the number of electrons. Okay? And so the significance of that is as follows. So if I have lanthanum 3 plus in solution, it will undergo a 3-electron reduction to lanthanum. 
Okay? Whereas in the gas phase, you try to add an electron into lanthanum, and you cannot form lanthanum 2 plus. Lanthanum 2 plus is not stable in water. Okay? And in fact, in the droplets, what happens is you will form a solvent separated ion pair in the droplet. Okay, in contrast, if you have iron 3 plus, you can add one electron to form iron 2 plus in solution, but the 2 plus will go to iron through a two electron reduction. Okay, in the gas phase, we can actually reduce iron to 2 plus from 2 plus to 1 plus. 1 plus is absolutely perfectly stable in, in solution, and we can actually measure this reduction potential. Okay, and so the difference here is that on, at the potential required to reduce 2 plus, the 1 plus, which is already at the electrode surface, um, is spontaneously goes to, to iron. Okay? And so you can measure things that you cannot measure in solution. Okay? And finally, one of the most um, important advantages is in solution, these are relative potentials, whereas in the gas phase, I'll show you that we can measure these things on an absolute basis. Okay, and this can be done at the equivalent of infinite dilution. And the other major component is that our experiments include the surface potential of water. Okay, and I'll sh uh, explain why that's significant in a minute. Okay, and so in order to do these experiments, I'm going to introduce two things. One is ion nanocalorimetry, which is the method we've developed to uh, uh, solve this, as well as a variety of other problems. And I'll also talk briefly um, about various spectroscopies that you can do with the ions and the droplets. Okay, and so most people are familiar with the basic problem um, in electrochemistry, and that is this is a table taken out of the back of a freshman uh, chemistry textbook. And what you see is the uh, electrochemical reduction potentials um, are a beautiful thermodynamic ladder. Okay, but that ladder has to be anchored to something and it's been anchored to the reduction potential of a proton. So this is the standard hydrogen electrode. And this has been arbitrarily set to zero. Okay? And so the reason for that is explained in chemistry textbooks. This is the book that I use for uh, instrumental analysis at Berkeley. And so it states, um, we must emphasize that no method can determine the absolute value of a potential of a single electrode, because basically all voltage measuring devices on measure only differences in potential. Okay? And like many things in textbooks, this turns out not to be entirely correct. Okay? And so here's the basic problem. Okay? And so the reduction of a proton by an electron, um, this can be arbitrarily defined either as a gas phase electron or as a solution electron. Uh, most definitions will treat this as a gas phase electron um, to form hydrogen gas. Okay, now in the gas phase, this is a very simple reaction, and people know exactly um, what the energy is associated with this. The problem is transferring charged particles into solution. Okay, and so to do this, you need to be able to take a proton from the gas phase and put it into water, which is simply the solvation energy of a proton. Okay, and so that value is also not known. Um, but you can see if you solve one problem, you can solve the other, because the only other factor is, is a well-characterized gas phase measurement. Okay, and so I should also point out, I'm going to use interchangeably the term absolute and real potential. Um, these differ simply by the surface potential of water, and we'll talk about the significance of that shortly. Um, but basically, the experimental data um, to, to measure this, and there have been a variety of different experiments. Most of them have been done. In fact, all of them have been done before 1988. And you can see a range of values that have been obtained. Uh, much more recently, a lot of theory, and particularly a cluster pair approximation method, which was introduced by Coe um, and uh, uh, Trular. Uh, we've modified this. And you can see we have a range of target values. Okay, but one of the, the challenging things here is when you bring a charged particle across a boundary, okay, there is a potential at that boundary in the case of water, and that has to be added to the potential um, of the solvation. Okay? And so the problem here is the surface potential of water, there's a wide variety of estimates. It's most likely a very small value, um, but this value is in fact not known. Okay, and so as a result of this, when we entered into this, um, we pulled up this very nice article from 1990 on the absolute electrode potential with a fairly definitive title, The End of the Story. Okay? And so basically, the conclusion of this paper is 
We have a range of estimated values on a range of different methods, but every single method includes some sort of approximation and model. Okay, and so nobody seemed to be really uh, convinced that the other person had, had solved the problem. Okay, and so we got into this about four or five years ago, and you need some money, so we wrote a proposal. And I'd like to share with you a review um, of that proposal. And uh, the, started out saying the applicants are not electrochemists, and the essential problem of determining an absolute electrode scale appears not to be adequately grasped. That turns out to have been a true statement. Um, we really didn't know what we were doing at the start. Um, but they went on and said the gas phase experiments cannot reproduce electrochemical situations. The former can be helpful to gain uh, qualitative insights into the latter, but they cannot give quantitatively useful results. Hence, the idea of establishing an absolute electrode scale via gas phase experiments is doomed to fail. Okay? So the next step is you have to find a student who's willing to work on the project um, and a project which is doomed to fail. And fortunately, uh, I had a fearless graduate student in Alex Donald who took this project on. And his PhD thesis is basically developing not just one, but three different methods to do this from gas phase measurements. And as I'll show you, one of these methods um, requires absolutely no models or theory. Um, everything can be determined entirely from experiment, including um, the uncertainty. And ultimately, we believe the accuracy of this method um, can be very similar to what a, the accuracy is of measuring a relative um, potential between two half cells in a solution. Okay, so the basic idea of this experiment um, is we're going to take a droplet which is stored in ultra-high vacuum. Okay, it's going to be temperature controlled. We will add energy, um, for example, in the form of an electron, um, if this is a positive ion. Okay, the energy uh, will result in heating of the droplet. That is, we'll convert the electronic energy um, into vibrational energy and so forth. And because these are stored in ultra-high vacuum, the energy has no place to go other than boiling off water molecules. Okay, and so as the water molecules boil off, the temperature of the droplet returns back to its original value, but the size of the droplet will change. Okay, and so basically all you have to do is count up the number of water molecules that leave, and that tells you what the recombination energy is. Okay, this is the opposite of ionization. On but it's a very important uh, point, is that this is an adiabatic value. Okay? And the difference here is if I reduce this charge state, okay, the water is going to want to reorganize around the lower charge state ion. Okay? And so for the ions that I'm going to show you, for example, a 3 plus ion, the solvent reorganization energy is a very, very large value. Okay? And so this is included in our experimental measurement because that reorganization time is much, much faster than the time scale of our overall experiment. So any energy you gain or lose through solvent reorganization simply appears as the number of water molecules that leave. Okay, and so here's the apparatus. Um, it's a uh, 2.8 Tesla Fourier transform ICR apparatus where the ions in the droplets are formed at atmospheric pressure. We transfer them intact. Um, they're trapped in a cooled cell. This, most of the experiments I'll show you are at about 130 degrees Kelvin. Um, we store them typically for several seconds so that they come to a thermal equilibrium with a black body radiation field. And then we interact these ions with uh, either lasers or, or electrons to probe the structures. Okay, and so here's an example of the experiment. So this is uh, uh, ruthenium hexamine, which is electrochemically active. This is a uh, uh, mass spectrum showing the various number of water molecules attached. Here we're mass selecting on a droplet which has 55 water molecules, and the only reason for this is if you do a quick calculation, this corresponds to one molar. It has absolutely other, no other significance. But now if you mass select that and add an electron, you convert a three plus ion into two plus ions, but these two plus ions lose either 17, 18, or 19 water molecules. Okay, and so the thing that should surprise you is this is a lot of water molecules coming off the cluster, and the distribution is relatively narrow. Okay, and I'll explain to you very shortly why it is you see the distribution that you see. 
Okay, just to give you a physical sense of what's happening in this experiment. Okay, so again, this ruthenium uh, hexamine with 55 water molecules, initial temperature is about 135 Kelvin. When it captures the electron, the temperature jumps up to about 480 Kelvin. Okay, but each water molecule that's lost carries away energy, and so the temperature of the drop is decreased until it gets back down to its original value. Okay, here's another ion, iridium hexamine, again with 55 water molecules, so the degrees of freedom in the system is exactly the same. This loses fewer water molecules because the recombination energy is less, and specifically the temperature now only goes up to about 420, and again it goes back down to its original temperature. Okay, and so this is the sort of data that we get in order to determine what the recombination energy is from the number of water molecules lost. Okay, here's the reason why you need to have um, ICR instruments. You need to be able to store the ions for a fairly long period of time. Okay, and the reason for that is there is a kinetic shift. As I deposit energy into an ion, as I increase the size of the ion, okay, it's going to take longer for it to fall apart. Okay, and so here's an example with lanthanum with 125 water molecules. It loses ultimately 11 water molecules, okay, and the first 10 come off faster than we can even detect, but the very last water molecule actually takes up to about three quarters of a second to come off from the droplet. Okay, so we have to wait on these experiments until the reaction is complete. Okay, so how do you get the thermochemistry out of the experiment? Okay, so again, we're going to activate a temperature-controlled cluster. This generates a hot cluster. We get evaporative cooling back down to the original temperature. And so each water molecule that leaves can remove energy in two forms. One is you have to break the binding energy of the water to the cluster. Okay? On the other form is basically any kinetic or rotational energy that a water molecule leaves with will also take uh, energy away from the cluster. Okay, and so there's a variety of ways of getting at this information. Originally, what we did is, is simply calculate binding energies based on a very simple Thomson liquid drop model. This is a model that we've uh, modified slightly to improve the accuracy. Uh, but basically, about 85 to 90 percent of the energy goes into breaking this bond. Okay? On the other part of the energy, we calculate simply with a statistical model, which includes translations and rotations. Vibrations really don't play a role under the conditions of the experiments. Um, and this removes somewhere on the order of about 10 to 15 percent of the energy. Okay, and so I just want to give you a physical sense of the energy partitioning, um, because it basically dictates the uh, distribution that we see. Okay, and this is using a, uh, a model developed originally by Klotz. And basically the idea is that when a, the first water molecule leaves from the droplet, the most probable kinetic and rotational energy is essentially zero. Okay? But there's some finite probability that each water molecule will carry away a certain amount of energy, but it's an exponentially decreasing function. Okay? So the first water molecule actually takes away on the order of about 0.1 electron volts. Okay, so now here's the results when you have two water molecules leaving. Okay, the probability of both water molecules leaving with exactly zero energy is essentially zero, and so this is now weighted out um, a little bit past zero. And when you convolve these exponential functions out to 17, 18, and 19 water molecules, what you get is what looks more or less like a Gaussian type distribution, which is centered somewhere about 1.3 electron volts. Okay, so we can now convolve this distribution onto our experimental data. Okay, and so that's the red line here. This is that theory uh, from kinetic energy release. This is the experimental data in black that I'm showing you. And so even though we put in 8.6 electron volts, which is more than enough to see 21 water molecules lost, you don't see that because some of the energy is taken away in the form of kinetic energy. Okay, and you can see that these actually fit very nicely. And what that tells you is the reason why you see three peaks in your product ion distribution is simply because of this kinetic energy release phenomenon. And it's consistent with the recombination energy being essentially a delta function, which it must be because it's an ionization energy. Okay, so the other thing is that um, when you do experiments on ions in the gas phase, you want to make sure that the ion in this droplet, and in fact the water around the ion, has the same structure as what it would be in bulk solution. 
Okay, and certainly for small clusters, things with fewer than 12, 15 water molecules, in many cases, things like the coordination number um, and the surface of the droplet is very different um, than what it would be in bulk solution. But as you get to larger and larger clusters, both the coordination number um, uh, as well as the, as I'll show you, the, the structure of water at the surface really does approach what you would see in bulk. Okay, and so for the coordination number, um, you can probe this either with infrared spectroscopy or you can look at uh, chemical reactions, charge separation versus hydrolysis, and they correlate beautifully in the gas phase and solution. Okay, but getting back to the structure of water at the surface, okay, because the definition of the standard hydrogen electrode potential takes a charged particle across the water interface. Okay, and so the question is, and we're doing the exact same thing in our experiment by taking an electron in vacuum, putting it into the droplet. Okay, and so the question is, what is the structure of water at the surface, and is this the exact same structure as what you'd expect on, at the bulk air-water interface, for example? Okay, and so to probe this, we can do infrared spectroscopy. And so in order to look at what is the structure of water um, in a size-selected fashion, um, what we chose to do is, is take a ion, which is essentially a hydrophobic ion, so it's a quaternary ammonium, surrounded by methyl groups, and this allows us to tag a droplet of basically any size. Okay, and so here is an infrared spectrum. This is that molecule, tetramethyl ammonium. This has 41 water molecules attached, and what I'm showing you is the infrared spectrum in the uh, OH stretch region. Okay, and what you see in the gas phase, which is green, are two peaks. One peak is very broad, okay, and in fact, it looks very much like the infrared spectrum of bulk water, which is in black, okay, and this is simply hydrogen bonding water molecules. Okay, what's different um, in the gas phase is we actually see a very sharp peak, and that peak corresponds to water molecules that are at the surface of the droplet. Specifically, they are water molecules that accept two hydrogen bonds, donate a hydrogen bond, and they have this free OH stretch. And this free OH stretch serves essentially as an antenna that we can use to probe how the ion affects the structure of water. Okay, and so in the case of cations, which is most of the data I'll show you, water is really already oriented in a way that it would like to be ultimately at the surface of the droplet. Okay, but in the case of some anions, water is very tightly coordinated in a way where the water points inward. But ultimately, if I build up a large enough droplet, water wants to be able to point um, so that one of these hydrogen bonds is pointed um, out towards the vacuum. Okay, and so the question is, what is the effect of this ion on the structure of water? Okay, and so one can do this in the case of sulfate. Here are several infrared spectra. Okay, and here all we're doing is changing the cluster size from 36 up to about 80 water molecules. Um, equivalent concentrations of about 1.5 molar going down to 0.7 molar. Okay, and so what you can see is as I build up the size of the droplet, the water, which is fully hydrogen bonded, that is water that's in the interior of the droplet, rapidly approaches what you'd expect to see in bulk solution. Um, but in the case of the smaller droplets, up to about 43 water molecules, basically all the water molecules are pointed inwards towards the ion. Okay, and it's not until you hit about 4750 water molecules that you start seeing water orient in a way that it would like to orient in the absence of this ion. Okay, and so that what says that basically things like sulfate can actually change the structure of water out past the second and even third solvation shell. Okay, as you build up the size of the droplet, this is now comparing an anion, I minus, versus a cation, sodium plus. You can see the spectroscopy is essentially identical. Okay, and so there are very subtle differences which we can explain. For example, there is a slight frequency difference here. That's simply a Stark effect, okay, from the different charged ions that are in the droplet. Okay, so basically what this says is that the surface of these droplets, whether you have a cation or an anion, is essentially the same as what you'd expect to see at the bulk air-water interface. Okay, and so it doesn't matter how the ion orients the water molecule initially, um, although many of these differences can, in fact, persist past the second or even third solvation shell, by the time you get up to large droplets, water does what it wants to do in the absence of the ion. Okay, and so that says that the surface of these droplets provide the same potential as what you'd expect to see in bulk water. 
Okay, so now what I'm going to show you are three different ways um, of establishing an electrochemical um, uh, potential from these measurements. Um, so what I've shown you is basically you can take a droplet of fixed size, add an electron, measure this recombination energy, but we still need to be able to put these droplets into bulk solution. Okay, and so the idea here is that if our measurements incorporate all the ion-specific effects, that is the orientation of water and so forth, then you can simply use a bulk solvation model to transfer this droplet intact into the bulk solution. Okay, so things like a Born solvation model. Okay, so that allows us to drive a delta H value in bulk solution. Again, one can reference the measurement either to a gas phase electron or a solution phase electron. We can measure this value as well. And one can convert a delta H into a delta G through solution phase entropy measurements. And those are measurements done by others. Okay, and if you do that, what you find is the following relationship. These are now our gas phase delta G values on, in our experiments. These are now the relative values for a variety of different systems which we've taken out of the literature. And you can see there's a fairly decent correlation in this data. And where this line crosses zero on the relative scale, that's the value on an absolute um, scale from our measurements. In this case, it's about 4.2 volts. Okay, there's a second largely independent route um, to measure this. I'm going to skip over this because of time. Um, but it has to do with hydrolysis. Again, one can come up with a nice correlation where now we're not correlating to electrochemical data, we're correlating to uh, solution phase hydrolysis data. Now the third method is, is really um, what we think is the best method, and it's also conceptually the simplest. And that is we know the recombination energy um, is inversely proportional to the radius of the droplet. So that simply means is if I grow a droplet in size, I should be able to extrapolate our data to an infinite droplet size. Okay? And so the data that I'll show you is plotting this recombination energy versus the number of water molecules to the minus one third. This is simply proportional to the radius. Okay? And when you do that, once you get past a certain size, about 55 water molecules, you can see, in fact, the data do follow a very nice straight line, extrapolated down to zero, allows us to obtain an absolute SHE potential of about 4.1 volts. Okay, so basically I've shown you three, well, I showed you two, but we have another independent method of, of measuring the absolute um, uh, standard hydrogen electrode potential. There's a variety of good reasons to, to, to be doing this. Um, but the question is, looking forward, how can you turn these into a definitive measurement? Okay, and so what we think is our method three, which is the extrapolation to infinite size, it's a method that requires absolutely no theory or modeling, and we think we can turn this method into uh, absolute uncertainty somewhere on the order of about 20 millivolts. Okay, and the two ways we need to do this is, one is we need to experimentally calibrate our nano nanocalorimetry method. I'll show you a way we're doing this using lasers. And uh, we also need to do this on much larger droplets, which we're now able to do because um, we've recently upgraded our magnet. Okay, so I thought I should show this picture of Alan, um, again, on an electrochemical uh, apparatus, which is fairly sophisticated. It's taken earlier this year, and I thought I'd use this simply as a segue into the next part of my talk. Yeah, I know. It's getting late. All right, so the next part of the talk is really um, weighing photons um, using mass spectrometry. Um, there's a variety of good reasons to do this. One is ion fluorescence. So I'll give you a, a short example of this. Um, but basically, this is not a new idea. Um, people like Alan have been pursuing this. Um, others, uh, this is actually work from uh, David Pritchard's group, where by very accurately weighing two ions in a uh, equivalent of an ICR cell, um, you can get the equivalent weight of a gamma ray. Okay? And so if you measure the energy of this gamma ray independently, basically what they showed is that Einstein um, basically got it right to within about 0.4 parts per million. Um, this is an uncertainty in the experimental measurement, not in Einstein's theory. Um, but we really need to be able to use mass spectrometry to ultimately weigh photons not with uh, mega electron volt energies, really down at somewhere on the order of about one to five electron volts. And this is a little bit more challenging. Five electrons corresponds to about uh, five nanodaltons, okay? And so 
If you have a conventional ICR instrument, and for most of us, this would require about 1,000 Tesla. Alan's been pushing the limits with a variety of different techniques to treat the data, and so he can probably get this down to 500 Tesla pretty easily. Um, but we're still about 997 Tesla short. And so the way we're going to do this is, again, with our nanocalorimetry method. Okay? And so the idea is exactly the same, except instead of coming in with an electron, we're going to come in with a photon of known energy, heat up the droplet, look at how many water molecules will leave. Okay, and so here's an example of the results. This is now isolating on this particular guy with 60 water molecules, letting it sit for a quarter of a second. You lose a water molecule due to absorption of black body photons. And what you see is 11 water molecules lost. Okay, and so we can actually now use this to calibrate on our nanocalorimetry method. And basically our modeling is good to within about 6%. We can get this basically dead on. Okay, so now what happens if an ion fluoresces? Okay, if I heat this up, if this emits a photon, that energy is not available to boil off water, and so it's going to cool back down to its original temperature, but we're going to have missing energy. Okay, and so to show you an example of that, here's a molecule that does fluoresce in solution. This is an ion with 50 water molecules. Again, it loses a single water molecule due to black body dissociation. But now when you turn the laser on, you see two peaks or two distributions, one corresponding to full internal energy conversion. So these are ions that have not fluoresced. But you also see a distribution for ions that have fluoresced. Okay? And so on the beauty of this is that we can get the energy of the emitted photon not by measuring it directly, but by simply weighing the products on, in the mass spectrum. Okay? And so from weighing these products, we come up with a photon energy of about 580 nanometers, which is basically very similar to what you would see in bulk solution. Okay, and the beauty of this is this is the equivalent of detecting every single photon, right? Because it doesn't matter what direction the photon leaves, we see the product ion distribution resulting from this. Okay, and so um, there's a variety of nice things you can do with this. Um, I'm basically out of time, but this is an example of, of uh, taking a droplet with just cerium, adding a hydroxide, both of these fluoresce, slightly different frequencies, but you add an NO3 minus group into the same droplet, and it completely quenches the fluorescence. Okay, so to get to the uh, uh, most important slide of the talk, this is just a, a slide showing that we can now generate much larger droplets. Um, this is a slide showing that Alan Marshall really is right. Uh, you get much better performance at, at high magnetic field strength. Um, but to finish up, I would like to acknowledge basically the people who have done these experiments. Um, Alex Donald is the guy who's done all the electrochemical experiments. Jim Prell and Jeremy O'Brien are the people who are doing the infrared spectroscopy. Um, I'd also like to show this picture, which is the sort of scientific view that we have of uh, Alan Marshall. Um, this is the back of his car. Basically, is uh, he pioneers new areas. Many of us follow and take advantage of, of all his developments. And so once again, I'd like to congratulate Alan um, on his award. And for everything that you've done um, in the field of mass spectrometry, um, and this includes both instrumentation, methodology, um, but also very personal um, interactions and, and developing people in the field. So thank you, Alan. <laughs>